Don't worry about this. So, Ezekiel. Ezekiel is not only telling a sermon, speaking it, but he's living it. He's acting it out. And we could call him the mind prophet, right? The Lord has called him to do some pretty bizarre things. Um, everything from laying on his side for over a year to digging a hole through his house, packing his bags and leaving with a mask over his face and all that that we looked at. And really the only significance was that these people are going to be taken by force into captivity. God's been telling them through prophets. And it's not just Ezekiel. Remember, Jeremiah lived at the same time. Daniel, too. We'll talk a little bit about him. Um, so there were prophets at the same time being used in different vicinities, different areas, but also in different ways. Ezekiel was acting things out because they would not listen to words coming out of mouth. So maybe they would stop and say, hey, what are you doing? <laughs> and uh, even that, the, the Lord was using it. And I think one of the biggest things I've taken away from the book of Ezekiel is no matter, kind of like this morning in Joshua chapter 11, the Lord saying, burn all of the chariots, hamstring all the horses, telling Joshua, I always find it amazing how the Lord puts these things together. We're in Joshua on Sunday morning and Ezekiel on Sunday night. What could those have in common? Well, the Lord will ask you to do some pretty bizarre things. Some pretty off the wall. It makes absolutely no sense to the natural man, to our thinking brains. Same idea. Why would you have me lay on my side? for that long, or dig a hole through my wall. All those things that we, in all honesty, would ask, and probably be justified in asking, what are you doing here, Lord? Where are you going with this one? But just like in our story with Joshua, just like in Ezekiel, you're giving people God's message of love, of hope, of redemption, ultimately. And so, chapter 14, the saga continues. And here we get to the state of the elders, the spiritual leaders. We've already gotten a glimpse of this earlier, but we get back to it, if you will. So chapter 14, verse 1. Then came certain of the elders of Israel unto me, and they sat before me. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their heart. That becomes the key here in this first section. That little phrase, in their heart or in his heart or in your heart. And put the stumbling block of their iniquity or their sin before their face. Should I be inquired of, the, of at all by them? Therefore speak unto them. And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God. Verse 4 goes on. Every man of the house of Israel that sets up his idol in his heart and puts the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face and comes to the prophet, I, the Lord, will, not, will answer him that comes according to the multitude of his idols. That I may take the house of Israel in their own hearts because they are all estranged from me through their idols. What idols will do is distant, distance you from God. So that's what we learn there. You're inquiring of me, but there's idols in your hearts. So verse 6 goes on, Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, Repent and turn yourselves from your idols. And turn away your faces from all your abominations. For every one of the house of Israel, 
or of the stranger that sojourneth in Israel, which separates himself from me and sets up his idols, here it is again, in his heart, and puts the stumbling block of his sin, his iniquity, before his face, and comes to a prophet to inquire of him concerning me, I, the Lord, will answer him by myself. And I will set my face against that man. And I will make him a sign and a proverb. And I will cut him off from the midst of my people. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. Verse 9. And if the people, or sorry, if the prophet be deceived when he has spoken a thing, I, the Lord, have deceived that prophet. And I will stretch out my hand upon him. And I will destroy him from the midst of my people, Israel. And they shall bear the punishment of their iniquity. The punishment of the prophet shall be even as the punishment of him that seeks unto him. So this first section here, verses 1 through 10 as we've read. A group of elders come to Ezekiel seemingly... It seems like they want to seek counsel from God. But they have idols. And it's interesting, too, that we might jump to the conclusion, there's the problem. They have idols. That's not the problem. We all have idols. They're hanging out in the house. They're all around. Idols are all around. We hold them up. We put them on pedestals. The problem is not idols. It says it over and over and over. The problem is in your heart. That's where it gets pretty scary. That's where we understand nobody knows our heart. We can fool a lot of people a lot of the time. But God alone knows your heart. Right? God alone sees the good and the bad. And the ugly. <laughs> and he knows our heart. It's, it's a lot like a marriage that's struggling. And they've been at it for years maybe. It's finally the last ditch effort. Let's make an appointment with the pastor. It's usually the last ditch effort. And they come in and the husband's just being a jerk. And the wife's not being any nicer. And the pastor just kind of after hearing him go at it, takes that man, stands him up and says, yeah, now you go in there and you tell that woman that you love her. And imagine the husband kind of sheepishly hanging his head. Okay, I'll go in. And he goes in and tells her, I love you. That's not going to mean a thing to that wife in honesty. What is that? That's forced. That's no different. And that's God here dealing with His people. It's your heart. It's not in it. I can't force you to do something. And you're, you're in love with these idols, these trinkets, these things that make you feel so good. Things that scratch your ears, tickle your fancy, whatever it is. We have these things that pop up in our lives. And so that's what's going on here with God's people. And it's the very elders, the, the spiritual leaders of Ezekiel's time that have these hearts that are far from God. There's no communication, no relationship whatsoever. They are so caught up in this idolatry. It's a warning not against them, but against us today. Because it's not much different. Well, the excuse was not much different than some excuses today. Verse 11, look at Verse 11, as it continues here, that the house of Israel may go no more astray from me, neither be polluted anymore with all their transgression or sin, but that they be, may be my people, and I may be their God, saith the Lord God. The word of the Lord came again to me, saying, Son of man, when the land sins against me by tr trespassing grievously, then will I stretch out my hand upon it, and I will break the staff and the bread thereof, and I will send famine upon it, and I will cut off man 
and beast from it. Verse 14, though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord God. If I cause noisome beasts to pass through the land, and they spoil it, so that it be desolate, that no man may pass through it because of the big beasts. Verse 16, though these three men were in it, as I live, saith the Lord, they shall be delivered, neither sons nor daughters. They only shall be delivered, but the land shall be desolate. Verse 17, or if I bring a sword upon the land and say, sword, go through the land so that I cut off man and beast from it. Though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, uh, were in that place, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall be delivered, neither sons nor daughters, but they only shall be delivered themselves. Or if I send a pestilence into the land and pour out my fury upon it in blood to cut off from it man and beast, though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter. They shall be delivered their own souls by their, uh, by their righteousness. Verse 21, For thus saith the Lord God, How much more when I send my four sore judgments upon Jerusalem, the sword, the famine, the noisome beast, and the pestilence to cut off from it man and beast. Yet, behold, therein shall be left a remnant. God always has a remnant. That shall be brought forth both sons and daughters. Behold, they shall come forth unto you. And ye shall see their way and their doings. And ye shall be comforted concerning the evil that I have brought upon Jerusalem. Even concerning all that I have brought upon it. And they shall, all, they shall comfort you when ye see their ways and their doings. And ye shall know that I have not done without cause all that I have done in it, saith the Lord God. So here in chapter 16, the point that God gets across here is that no matter what, the judgment is going to come. And even his, part of his judgment, we kind of missed, I, I read through it, verse 9. Uh, if you just kind of jump back and look at verse 9. And if the prophet be deceived when he has spoken a thing, I, the Lord, have deceived that prophet. Wait a minute, I thought I had you all figured out, God. You deceive? No, you can't put God in a box, no matter how little or big that box might be. And you might just jot second or sorry, first Kings. First Kings 22, 21. In First Kings 22, it's a fascinating story. I've always loved first and second Kings. But first Kings, the last chapter in First Kings, chapter 22. There's these this evil king that has got to go. <laughs> They're fallen leaders. And God is looking. For anyone. The king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, Did I not tell ye, thee that he would prophesy no good thing concerning me, but evil only? And so he said, Hear thou therefore the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, and all the hosts of heaven, heaven were standing by the Lord, on his right hand and on his, on his left. And the Lord said, Who shall persuade Ahab? that he may go up and fall to Ramoth Gilead. And one said on this matter, and another on, this, on that matter. Here's 1 Kings 22, 21. And there came forth a spirit that stood before the Lord and said, I will go and deceive him. And the Lord said unto him, Wherewith? And he said, I will go forth, and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of a prophet. Interesting. See, God always works with what he has. And God will judge 
different people. We talked a little bit about this this morning too. Even using Joshua and the Israelites as instruments of his judgment. It's not always pretty. We don't like it. Because it means utterly destroying everything breathing. <laughs> Leaving nothing alive. That's God's judgment. Over 400 years God had put up with sacrificing babies and fires and bestialities and, and all kinds of perverted things that you can look up the Canaanites and see the kind of practices they were into. Not just the Canaanites, the, those of Hazor and those of the Amorites and the, all of the Ites, Hittites, all of these guys that were into some wicked, perverted, as I said, if they were around today, we would say, please, somebody arrest these people. Put them away. Put them out of their misery. So God is using this judgment, and part of the judgment is that the prophets themselves, the elders themselves are deceived. How can I keep from being deceived? How can you keep from being deceived? Being sucked into some cult. We're doing it tonight. This is how you are kept from deception. You can ask any bank teller. They're all day. They're dealing with money. They handle it. They feel it. Guess what? When a counterfeit comes along, they know better than 90% of the population. Why? Because all day they study and handle the real thing. Like you and I. If all day we're studying, getting familiar, handling the real thing, Jesus Christ, His Word. As soon as some off-the-wall thing comes along, we just, it goes up naturally because we've been in the, in the Word. Same thing. The counterfeit will come along. The deception will come along. God does what He does when He does it, how He does it. <laughs> Still the best I think the best description I've ever heard of God's sovereignty. What does the sovereignty of God mean? Well, it's basically where, where a 500-pound gorilla sits, wherever he wants. Nobody's stopping him. That's the sovereignty of God. He does what he wants. Well, that's not fair. God is deceiving people. That's not right. That, to who? Are you God or is he? Your small view of God needs to expand. Happens a lot with me. So it's, again, God using all of these things. And they, like I said, you might jot down Jeremiah 15, 1. In Jeremiah 15, first verse, Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 1, he sounded just like this. Only he didn't use Noah Daniel and Job. Jeremiah used Moses and Samuel, which made a lot more sense in his case because he was talking about interceding for the people, interceding for the nation in Jeremiah 15. Bringing up these Old Testament characters, Samuel and Moses, who were great intercessors. They, they were the stand between. Samuel being one of the first prophets of God on the scene to speak on behalf of God to the people. <coughs> and so Jeremiah 15, 1, kind of the same idea. Who, even if, and, and the way Jeremiah puts it is, even if Samuel and Moses were here praying for you, the judgment's coming. And see, what these people were doing is a lot of times what we can do and that's, you won't destroy America. We have, well, now I don't know who we have. There was a time where you could say, we have Billy Graham. We have these incredible Bible teachers. You can't, the judgment of America can't come. We produce all kinds of Bibles and do all kinds of good deeds all around the world. You can't judge this place. That was the same idea here. Daniel was alive. <laughs> and he was kind of a legend because he was so young and he was so close 
uh, to Nebuchadnezzar, the very leader of, of things at the time. So I guess I just had to write down a few things that Noah, Daniel, and Job have in common. And by the way, they're not in chronological order. <laughs> Job would be first, and Noah would be second, and then would come uh, Daniel, who's alive at the time that this, be, this is being written. But that's not really important. What do these guys have in common? It's that they stood alone in their time. Noah stood alone in his time. In fact, we don't even know what his wife's name was. She was just Mrs. Noah. And so, that he had his three sons, but that was just to repopulate the earth. We don't know how much they were involved with the building of the boat and the obedience and the preaching that he did. He alone stood for what was right. Daniel, same way. Job, same way. In fact, Job had a thorn in his side called his wife. <laughs> and and uh, they could not, what's interesting is the warning that Noah sent out went unheeded. In other words, nobody converted, nobody listened. The warning that Noah sent out went unheeded. Daniel could not save the nation. He was, and as close as Daniel became to Nebuchadnezzar and Nebuchadnezzar's son, uh, Belteshazzar, all of these things, as close as Daniel was, he couldn't save the nation. And then Job, we all know Job, could not save his family. Yet all of these powerful, strong men that were used mightily by God, and God takes note of them, it's pretty cool here. But what's the point? The point is, I can't get to heaven on my dad's shirt tail, coat tail. Same with you. Same with me. We can't get to heaven on the basis of, well, my great-grandpa was a pastor. Using that same thing. Well, you can't judge me. Daniel and Job and Noah came from Israel. <laughs> and so that's the idea there. And it's a, it's a really powerful lesson for us to understand, you know, that it doesn't matter. Um, we all have to answer for ourselves. In fact, we will all stand before the Lord and it's going to be just you and the Lord. Don't think that you are going to be protected by someone that you might be linked to or that you might have some relationship with. When we stand before the Lord, it is going to be for yourself. There is not going to be anyone to point to and blame. This is the danger, by the way, a big in a grave danger. That, that there is in psychology. Because why are you bipolar? Why are you clinically depressed? Why are you suicidal? Well, it's mom, it's dad, it's uncle, it's grandpa, it's this cousin, it's that relation. Psychology does something though, they prescribe the answer. We know the answer, it's Jesus Christ. He's the answer for clinical depression, suicide. But they will stand before God, won't they? We will all stand before God. There's not going to be a grandpa to point to and say, well, it wasn't my fault. There's not going to be somebody there to point to and blame. Ask Adam. Ask Eve. They tried that game in the very beginning, didn't they? All the way to the serpent. Adam, him. <laughs> God says, Adam, what happened? It's the woman that you put in here with me. <laughs> okay, Eve, what happened? It's that serpent. We do the same thing. We haven't evolved much. <laughs> Pointing the finger, we just get a lot more better at it. Lay down on a couch, 
See how far back we can go in our ancestry? Oh, and we have big helps with that. No, we're all going to stand. It doesn't matter. And God does it over and over. Doesn't he state that over and over for a reason? Even if Noah and Daniel and Job were here, praying on your behalf, even if they were there in the land, guess what? They could be saved, but not you. In other words, judgment is coming. Payday one day. We're all going to stand before the Lord. Well, ex uh, Exodus. Ezekiel. Ezekiel 15. We continue through here. The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, what is the vine tree more than any tree? Or than a branch which is among the trees of the forest. Shall wood be taken of the vine tree and to do any work? Or will men take a pen of it to hang any vessel thereon? Verse 4, Behold, look, it is cast into the fire for fuel, but the fire devours both the ends of it, and the midst of it is burned. The middle of it is burned. Is it good for anything? Verse 5, Behold, when it was whole, it was meat for no work. How much less shall it be meat yet for any work when the fire has devoured it and it is burned? Therefore, as thus saith the Lord God, as the vine tree among the trees of the forest, which I have given to fire for fuel, so will I give the inhabitants of Jerusalem and I will set my face against them. They shall go forth, or sorry, go out from one fire, and another fire shall devour them. And ye shall know that I am the Lord when I set my face against them. And I will make the land desolate because they have committed a trespass, saith the Lord God. So, and you could jot Jeremiah chapter 2, verses 20 and on. Jeremiah 2.20, Hosea chapter 10, Isaiah chapter 5. You could just have those as notes that compare um, really looking at Israel, Jerusalem and Israel as a vine, as a vineyard. This is not something new. It's throughout the scripture likened to a vineyard. And God is making another point here, especially here in Ezekiel chapter 15. And that's, what do you ever see that's made out of grape wood? Vine wood. And the answer is nothing. Why? It's too fragile. It's pretty crooked and bent. Nobody ever makes a guitar out of grape wood. <laughs> Nobody makes any, a table out of wood that comes off of a vineyard. What good is wood from a vineyard anyways? That's what God's asking. Even for firewood, it's not any good. It's too moist. It just doesn't even burn well. What is grape wood good for? Well, only one thing. Bearing fruit. And John chapter 15 is number one on the list to write next to Ezekiel 15. Because Jesus <coughs> makes the greatest parallel with the vineyard and bearing fruit. Who is the vine? Make sure you remember it's not Israel. We can make the mistake of thinking, especially after reading Romans uh, 9, 10, and 11, chapters 9, chapters 10, and chapter 11, we read things like we are grafted in. And we can think with these parables about even Israel being likened to a vineyard, Jesus, at the very beginning of John 15, makes a very important statement. John 15, 1. I am the true vine. And that's the important thing to remember. We've been grafted in to Jesus Christ. The true vine. Now God has chosen His people but don't forget that. You'll get all messed up where you start thinking that all the promises of Israel are for you. 
and you start getting off course. But the point is that what are we good for? God chooses us just like He chose the nation Israel. We're good for bearing fruit, glorifying God. We're only put here to glorify God, to bring glory to Him and bear much fruit. And it's everything else is a distraction. We exist for one reason, one purpose, and that is to glorify God. Well, what is fruit? What is the fruit of the Spirit? Ultimately, it's love, isn't it? Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. The fruit of the Spirit is love. And not the mushy, gushy kind of love. But the love of God that changes us from the inside out. <coughs> Excuse me. How much does God love you? Ezekiel chapter 16. Let's find out how much God loves you. <laughs> chapter 16. I know you thought I was really going to get through it. Let's, let's dig in. Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, cause Jerusalem to know her abominations, and say, Thus saith the Lord God of, unto Jerusalem, Thy birth and thy nativity is of the land of Canaan. Your father was an Amorite, and your mother was a Hittite. And as for the nativity, thy, thy nativity, in the day thou were, was born, thy navel was not cut, neither was thou washed in water to supple thee. Thou wast not salted at all, nor swaddled at all. No eye pitied thee to do any of these things unto thee, to even have compassion upon thee, but thou wast cast out in the open field to the loathing or the hatred of all persons that walked by in the day that thou wast born. And when I passed by thee and saw thee polluted in thine own blood, I said unto thee, When thou wast in thy blood, live. Yea, I said unto thee, When thou wast in thy blood, live. I have caused thee to multiply as the bud of the field, and thou hast increased and waxed and green or great, and thou art come to excellent ornaments. Thy breasts are fashioned, and thine hair is grown, whereas thou wast naked and bare. Verse 8 Now when I pass by thee and looked upon thee, behold, thy time was the time of love. And I spread my skirt over thee, and covered thy nakedness. Yea, I swore, uh, swear unto thee, and entered into a covenant with thee, saith the Lord God, and thou became mine. Verse 9, Then I washed you with water, yea, thoroughly washed away your blood from thee. And I anointed thee with oil, I clothed thee also with broidered work, and I shod thee with badger's skins, and I girded thee about with fine linen, and I covered thee with silk. I decked thee also with ornaments, and I put bracelets upon your hands, and a chain around your neck, and I put, on jewel, uh, put a jewel on your forehead, and earrings in your ears, and a beautiful crown upon your head. Thus was thou decked with gold and silver and your raiment or your clothing was of fine linen and silk and broidered work. Thou didst eat fine flour and honey and oil and you were uh, exceeding beautiful and thou did prosper into a kingdom. And thy, known, uh, and thy renown went from forth among the heathen for thy beauty for it was perfect through my comeliness, which I had put upon thee, saith the Lord God. God made Israel, Jerusalem, which would become the capital of Israel, beautiful, beyond compare. Where the heathen 
That's the nations that were round about desired to come and see. God did all of that. He's doing the same work in you and in me. We were abandoned. We were found in a Canaanite land. God does all these incredible things. And so verse 15, what did they do? <laughs> but thou, you trusted in your own beauty and played the harlot because of your renown, your popularity, and poured out the for your fornications on everyone that passed by. His it was. That's whoever came, it was his. Verse 16, and of thy garments you, you did take your decks deckest thy high places with diverse colors and played the harlot thereupon. The, the like things shall not come, neither shall it be so. Verse 17, Thou hast also taken thy fair jewel, jewels among of my gold and of my silver, which I had given thee, and madest, thee, uh, madest to thyself images of men, and didst come... Uh, Comet whoredom, commit whoredom with them. Verse 18, and you took your broidered garments and covered them, and thou hast set mine oil and mine incense before them. My meat also which I gave thee, fine flour and oil and honey, wherewith I fed thee, thou hast even set it before them for a sweet savor. And thus it was, saith the Lord God, Moreover, thou hast taken thy sons and your daughters, whom thou hast borne unto me, and these hast thou sacrificed unto them to be devoured. Is this of your whoredoms a small matter? It's a question for all of us, isn't it, today? They're trying to make it a small matter. We've done very well in America at that. Verse 21, that thou hast slain my children and delivered them to cause them to pass through the fire for them. And in all thine abominations and thy whoredoms thou hast done, or thou hast not remembered the days of your youth, when you were naked and bare and was polluted in your own blood. And it came to pass after all thy wickedness, woe, woe unto thee, saith the Lord God that thou hast also built unto thee an imminent place and hast made thee an high place in every street. Verse 25, thou hast built thy high place at every head of the way and hast made thy beauty to be abhorred and hast opened thy feet to everyone that has passed by and multiplied your whoredoms. Verse 26, thou hast also committed for fornication with the Egyptians, thy neighbors, great of flesh, and has increased your whoredoms to provoke me to anger. Behold, therefore, I have stretched out mine hands uh, over thee and have diminished thine ordinary food and delivered thee an, into the will, unto the will of them that hate thee, the daughters of the Philistines. Which, were, which are ashamed of the lewd way, your lewd way. Thou hast played the whore also with the Assyrians. Because you were unstable, yea, thou hast played the harlot with them, and yet couldst not be satisfied. Thou hast moreover multiplied thy fornication in the land of Canaan unto Chaldea, and yet thou wast not satisfied herewith. How weak is your heart, saith the Lord God, seeing thou dost all these things, the work of an impurous, whorish woman, and in that thou buildest thine enemies an uh, imminent place in the head of every way, and make your high place in every street, and has not been an heart as an harlot in thou in that thou scornest higher, but as a wife that commits adultery, which takes strangers instead of her husband. 
They give gifts to all whores, but thou have given gifts to all your lovers and hired them <laughs> that they may come unto thee and on every side for thy whoredoms. And, thy, and the, con the contrary is in thee from other women in thy whoredoms, whereas none follows thee to commit whoredoms, and in that thou givest a reward, and no reward is given unto you. Therefore thou art contrary. You contradict yourself. Wherefore a harlot, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, because your filthiness was poured out, and your nakedness discovered, through your whoredoms, with your lovers, and with all the idols of thy abominations, and by the blood of your children which thou didst give unto them, behold, therefore, I will gather all your lovers with whom they, thou hast taken pleasure, and all them that thou hast loved, with all them that thou hast hated. I will even gather them round about against thee, and will discover thy nakedness unto them, that they may see all thy nakedness. And I will judge thee as a woman that breaks wedlock. And shed blood are judged. And I will give thee blood in fury and in jealousy. I will also give thee in their hand, and they shall throw down thine imminent place and shall break down thy high places. They shall strip thee also of thy clothes, and shall take thy fair jewels, and leave thee naked and bare. Verse 40. They shall also bring up a company against thee, and they shall stone thee with stones, and thrust thee through with their swords. And they shall burn your houses with fire, and execute judgments upon you in the sight of many women, and I will cause thee to cease from playing the harlot. And thou shalt also uh, give no hire any more. So will I make my fury toward the rest, or toward thee to rest, and my jealousy shall depart from thee, and I will be quiet, and I will no, be no more angry, because thou hast not remembered the days of your youth, but has fretted me in all these things. Behold, therefore, I will also recompense thy way upon thine head, saith the Lord God. And thou shalt not commit this lewdness above all thine abominations. Verse 44, Behold, everyone that uses Proverbs shall, be, shall use this proverb against thee, saying, as, as is the mother, so is her daughter. Thou art thy mother's daughter the, that loatheth her husband and her children. And thou art the sister of thy sisters, which loatheth her, uh, their husbands and their children. Your mother was an Hittite, your father was an Amorite. And thine elder sister is Samaria. She and her daughters that dwell at thy left hand and thy younger sister that dwell at thy right hand is Sodom and her daughters. Verse 47, Yet hast thou not walked after their ways, their ways, nor done after their abominations, but as if, it, as if that were a very little thing, thou wast corrupted more than they, all, they in all thy ways. As I live, saith the Lord God, Sodom thy sister has not done, she nor her daughters, as thou hast done, that thou and thy daughters. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom, pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy, and they were haughty and committed again abomination before me. Therefore I took them away as I saw good. Neither hath Samaria committed half of thy sins, 
but thou hast multiplied thine abominations more than they, and hast justified thy sisters in all thine abominations which thou hast done. Thou also which hast judged thy sisters, bear thine own shame for thy sins, that thou hast committed more abominable than they. They are more righteous than thou, Yea, be thou confounded also, and bear thy shame in what thou hast justified thy sister. Verse 53, when I, when I shall bring again their captivity, the captivity of Sodom and her daughter, and the captivity of Samaria and her daughters, then will I bring again the captivity of thy captives in the midst of them, that thou mayest Bear thine own shame, and mayest be confounded in all that thou hast done, in that thou art a comfort unto them, being a comfort to wicked, wicked people, because you're more wicked. Verse 55, When thy sisters Sodom and her daughters shall return to their former estate, and Samaria and her daughters shall return to their former estate, then thou, thou and thy daughters shall return to your former estate. For thy sisters, Sodom, was not mentioned by thy mouth in the day of thy pride, before thy wickedness was discovered, as at the time of thy reproach of the daughters of Syria, and all that are round about her, the daughters of the Philistines, which despise thee round about. Thou hast borne thy lewdness and thine abominations, saith the Lord. For thus saith the Lord God, I will even deal with, with thee as thou hast done, which has despised the oath in breaking the covenant. Nevertheless, I will remember my covenant with thee in the days of thy youth. And I will establish unto thee an everlasting covenant. Then thou shalt remember thy ways and be ashamed. When thou shalt receive thy sisters, thine elder and thine younger, and I will give them unto thee for daughters, but not by thy covenant. And I will establish my covenant with thee, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord, that thou mayest remember and be confounded, and never open thy mouth any more because of thy shame, when I am pacified throughout or toward thee. For all that thou hast done, saith the Lord God. Should we do chapter 17? What do you guys think? Okay. <coughs> I had to just put it out there. You know. <laughs> God's love for you is beyond your wildest dreams. What they would do when a child was born is salt them. They didn't have all the ointments and cream that we have, so they would use salt as an antiseptic. And so they would sprinkle salt on the baby. And God likens Jerusalem at the very beginning of this chapter like a newborn baby has been neglected. She's been left on its own. Even kind of carelessly being thrown around. And God says, that was your state when I found you. When I found you, you were lost. You were damaging yourself. You were, all, you were beyond repair, many would look at you and say. See, Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem was not confounded, uh, it was not founded by the Jews. We're looking at that actually, the origins of it in the book of Joshua. They were there in the Canaanite area, weren't they? God established it. It wasn't until King David came along to where Jerusalem would then be uh, the capital city of Israel. And so Jerusalem becomes God's city, the city of God. That's what Jerusalem would become known as. It still is known as that. And there was a time 
when it was beautiful, cared for. Silk is like today's most luxurious, luxurious thing, item, the most expensive, and God says, I clothed you with silk. You know, it's just covering you. I had only the best in mind for you. What did you do with it? You went and sold it all for profits. It's not much different than the church. God has given us all that we need for godliness. What do we do? We see what, how we can make money from it. We see what big business opportunities we can get ourselves into. And being totally led astray and actually a laughing stock to regular prostitutes. Did you catch that? <laughs> to regular whores and prostitutes, Jerusalem as a city is actually paying to be treated like a prostitute. So the whoredom, God takes it further to where we see what he sees. That's why the language is so harsh. That's why you start to say, yeah, no wonder the rabbis say you're not allowed to read this book till you're 30. Because <laughs> to see things from God's perspective, it's eye-opening. It jogs our brain a bit. It should. Because they've been given so much, brought from nothing, brought from total despair. And then they've taken it and basically full circle back to not just where they began, but further down where the world, the nations, those that pass by are laughing. Saying, what a joke. And Jer Jeremiah spoke of this happening, that you would become a byword. In other words, we would say a cuss word. That's happened. The word Jew has become a derogatory cuss word. Many times. And that, again, this was all because of their disobedience. But it's not much different. I can't help but see America in this. And more specifically, the church in America. We have been washed and we've been anointed. That's the title of the message. You thought I'd never get to it. Well, he said that I washed you in water and I've anointed you with oil. That's all it takes. How are we washed? Well, Ephesians chapter 5, we're washed by the water of his word. And Hebrews chapter 13, verse 12, in his blood, with his blood, we're washed, cleansed. And ultimately, Psalm 23, verse 5, we're anointed with the oil of His Holy Spirit. His Holy Spirit is that oil that blends everything. Well, it's God Almighty. It comes upon us. We have been given everything. Not to mention uh, Isaiah 61, 10. He's clothed us in linen with righteousness, just like He clothed Jerusalem, and she's become a beautiful city. So blessed. So beautiful. And you turn around and do such wickedness. Again, God's Word is meant to cut us. It's meant to convict because the Holy Spirit convicts us doesn't condemn you. Understand, you're no different. We're all here together, under the scalpel together, undergoing surgery of the heart, understanding this needs to be cut out. This idolatry, this worldliness, this carnal nature that I have, it needs to be cut out. And it's His Word. It acts as that sword of the Spirit so that God will come in and cut out those areas. 
He was desiring to do that with, with them, sending them the prophets, the word of God over and over, and no one listened. Nobody listened. Nobody even turned. They became hardened. Again, much like we're seeing in America, the, the, the famine is not food. It's the Word of God. It's not being taught. It's not being heard. Nobody reads through like we just did. It doesn't happen anymore. It's very rare. And it's awesome to see there's the few, right? The few, the proud. Only we are not proud because we understand that keeps us from, from Him. <laughs> but we will seek the Lord and we need this, don't we? It's called nourishment, encouragement, encouragement, nourishment for us. This is it. You're not going to get it from television. You're not going to get it from talking with friends and people out there. This is different. The Word of God is what feeds us, what we live by. So thank you, God, for your Word this evening. Thank you as we see that you took care of your people. Lord, we see you as a loving Father that sees us as His children. Lord, that there is no, no greater love that anyone has than to lay down his life so that the bride could be presented, we as the bride could be presented spotless, blameless, perfect. Lord, even sinless. We thank you so much, Lord, for your word. Speak to us even as we respond in worship now, Lord. May we just have hearts that are open hearts that are ready to just sup with you, just to sit at your feet and to be in awe, to adore you, Lord. Thank you. Let's sing.